Parshas Vayechi is the shortest Parsha in the book of Genesis and the final one. It clots in at 85 verses, the only one that has fewer than 100 verses in the whole book of Genesis. And in this Parsha, we're going to close the storyline of the Jewish people as a family or even as a tribe by the time we arrive at the book of Exodus. Next week, the Jewish nation has burgeoned already in the land of Egypt. And if you look at this parsha in a Torah scroll, you'll notice an unusual characteristic. Usually, between each parsha, there is a break equivalent of nine letters. You'll have a, a break in the to- actual Torah scroll where there's no letters written for the space of nine letters. Whereas between last week's parsha, Parsha's Vayigash, and this week's parsha, Parsha's Vayichi, there is no break and there's no separation between the two. And the first Rashi in the Parsha tries to answer that question. Why is this Parsha closed up? There's no break between last week and this week's Parsha. And he tells us two answers. Because in this week's Parsha, Jacob's going to die. And when Jacob dies, the heart and the eyes of Israel are going to be closed up because of the pain and the suffering of the enslavement. Because when Jacob died, the enslavement began. And therefore, the Parsha is kind of highlighting this degradation, the fact that the Jewish people's hearts were closed up, and the Parsha mirrors that, and it too closes up, which is an interesting idea that the Torah is going to mirror the state of the Jewish people. If the Jewish people are going to be closed up, their hearts, their eyes are shuttered because of the pain that they're experiencing, the Torah will mirror that and reflect that it too will be closed up and won't have that break. But it's interesting. Rashi tells us here that when Jacob died, the enslavement began. In the book of Exodus, we find that that's actually not the case. We find that the Torah tells us in the book of Exodus, the death of Levi, which is Jacob's son. And Rashi explains over there that the reason why it tells us when Levi died specifically, it doesn't tell us when the rest of the brothers died, with the exception of Joseph. It's because Levi was the one who lived the longest amongst his brothers. And when he died, that's when the enslavement began. The Egyptians waited until all the sons of Jacob were deceased before they actually started enslaving the Jewish people. So here Rashi says that it's the death of Jacob that kickstarts the enslavement. And the book of Exodus, Rashi tells us something different, that it is the death of Levi, the son of Jacob, that kickstarts the enslavement. Which one is it? And the answer is that the enslavement was multifaceted. Of course, there was the actual physical enslavement. The Jewish people were forced to work. They were enslaved. But there was also a spiritual subjugation. There was also the effects of being acculturated, of being submitted to the way of life in Egypt, that the Jewish people were, so to speak, enslaved by Egyptian culture. They were influenced by the ways of the people around us, and that too constitutes an enslavement. When Jacob was around, the Jewish people or the Jewish family had nothing to worry about. He was such a beacon, such a leader, such an inspiration, they were not affected by the surroundings around them. However, once Jacob passed away, the spiritual enslavement began, and indeed it was only when Levi passed away that the physical enslavement, the second part of the enslavement, began as well. And it's interesting, if the enslavement is multifaceted, there's a physical and a spiritual enslavement, we will find in the book of Exodus that when the Exodus happens, when the redemption happens, it too happens on two levels. There is the physical redemption, and there is the spiritual redemption. Perhaps the second way to understand this idea of the spaces between each Parsha and not having that spaces here in this Parsha because of the death of Jacob is that when you finish a Parsha, you know, you have time to reflect, time to ponder, time to internalize. But now as the Jewish people are heading into exile, they're heading into enslavement, there really is nothing to reflect upon. There's nothing to ponder. You cannot internalize it. Sometimes there's nothing but faith. There may seem like there's no path forward, there's no way out of the maze, and there's nothing that you could do to figure it out, and there's no point necessarily on pondering and reflecting upon it. You have to just absorb it. So Jacob is living in the land of Egypt for 17 years, and he is 147 years old, and he is about to pass away. 
So he calls over Joseph and he tells him, Joseph, please, if I found favor in your eyes, please place your hand under my thigh. Please swear, give an oath and do kindness and truth with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt for I will lie down with my fathers and you shall transport me out of Egypt and bury me in their tomb. Several weeks ago, we read about Abraham. He purchased this special cave of the patriarchs in the city of Hebron. Isaac is buried there with his wife, Rebecca. Abraham is buried with his wife, Sarah. Jacob already buried Leah, his first wife, there. He wants to be buried and be transported from the land of Egypt to Hebron to be buried there. But he wants to make sure that Joseph tends to this responsibility. So Joseph responds, I personally will do as you have said. Jacob insists that Joseph swears. Joseph swears and Israel prostrates himself. Jacob bows down towards the head of the bed. So there's a few things to point out over here. First of all, the idea of chesed ve'emes, kindness and truth. Jacob wants Joseph to do kindness and truth with him by burying him in the land of Israel in the cave of the patriarchs. Rashi tells us that there's kindness that has truth and there's kindness that does not have truth. The only kind of kindness that you have that has truth is when you do kindness with the deceased. When someone is deceased, it's impossible for you to anticipate any future kickback. If I do kindness with someone, well, I can can hope that sometime later on, they'll do kindness with me. But if they're already deceased, the only reason why I will do kindness with them is because of truth without any ulterior motives. And that is the highest form of kindness. And Jacob asks Joseph, do truth, do kindness with me, bury me in the land of Israel. So if you read Jacob's request, it's really two requests. Number one, not to be buried in Egypt. Number two, to yes, be buried in the tomb of the patriarchs. Why does Jacob not want to be buried in the land of Egypt? So Rashi gives us three different reasons. Number one, because Jacob prophetically sees that in the future, there's going to be the plagues that are going to strike Egypt. And the third plague is going to be the plague of lice. And the entire earth is going to be crawling with lice. And he doesn't want lice gnawing at his body. And this indicates that for us, Even the body is holy, of course. The soul is really our identity, and at death, the soul and body separate. But here, we see that even after the separation of body and soul, even after the body has been divested of the soul, it's still holy, and Jacob does not want his body to be infested with the lice. That's the first reason why he doesn't want to be buried in Egypt. Secondly, very interesting, Rashi tells us that another reason why Jacob did not want to be buried in Egypt is because during the resurrection, the body has to roll to Israel to be reborn there. If the body is already in the land of Israel, it can be resurrected, no problem right away. However, if the body is outside of the land of Israel, it has to roll and tumble its way from wherever it is interred to the land of Israel to be resurrected there. Interesting. Thirdly, Rashi tells us, is that Jacob did not want to be buried in the land of Egypt because he didn't want the Egyptians to deify him. Jacob was a hero in Egypt. When he arrived, Rashi told us that the famine ceased and the waters overflowed the Nile, and he was revered. And he was worried that if he was entombed there, he would be deified. And this is something we find out throughout Jewish history. We have such giants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the great sages of the Mishnah of the Talmud, And in our eyes, the eyes of the Jewish people, you know, we realize that they're human. Even Moses, Moses we're going to meet next week in the beginning of Exodus, the greatest human that ever lived, but also the one that is criticized by the Torah most frequently. We recognize that he is indeed human. The Gentiles, the Egyptians, they were so wowed by Jacob, Jacob was worried that they would make him into an idol, they would deify him, and he didn't want that, of course, so he wanted to be buried outside of Egypt. Of course, there was, uh, 2,000 years ago, a renegade yeshiva student, uh, J.C., who taught some of the Torah of his teacher, Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachia, and the Gentiles were so impressed by what they heard, they had never heard 
Torah and they deified him. Who knows what would have happened had the Gentiles been privy to the wisdom of the Rambam of Maimonides, perhaps they would have deified him as well. So Jacob does not want to be buried in Egypt, and he does want to be buried in Israel. So he asks Joseph. Joseph is the one that has the ability to make that happen. He, after all, is the viceroy of Egypt. He asks him to make that pledge, but also he makes him swear. Why does he make him swear? Why does he not trust him and just say, you know, I'll trust your word? Why does he make him place his hand on his hip, on his thigh, and make him give an oath? So I think there may be, there's maybe a few ways to understand that. First of all, Joseph, of course, he was Jacob's child, but he was, after all, living in Egypt for a long time, and he was part of their hierarchy, and maybe he had some sort of allegiances towards his Egyptian self. And therefore, what Jacob was really asking is to, to him to make a, a clear and affirmative and authoritative and definitive decision, what are your allegiances? Are you a Jew first or are you a, an Egyptian first? Are you going to bury me here in Egypt or are you going to bury me in Israel? Joseph indeed swears, responds in the affirmative. Jacob bows to the bed. He knows that his bed is complete. He knows that all of his children are indeed going in the proper path. And we will see indeed at the end of the Parsha, perhaps there was another astute reason why Joseph had to make an oath, because had he not made an oath, Pharaoh would not have allowed Jacob to be taken to Israel. After Joseph swears in the affirmative, Jacob prostrates himself. He bows down to the head of the bed. Why does he do that? So Rashi tells us that hovering over the bed of sick people, of ill people, is the Shekhinah, is the divine presence. An interesting idea that the divine presence is close to someone who is ill. Why? Because someone who is ill, someone who recognizes their vulnerability, they are close to God. To the degree that someone is confident, is certain in themselves, they have it all. They don't need to worry for a second. By doing that, by exhibiting that, by feeling that, they are repelling God from them. Our sages tell us that small children have a special divine guardian angel because they recognize their shortcomings. They recognize that they are fallible. They recognize that they can do things on their own. That recognition of vulnerability brings God close to them and therefore affords them a special guardianship by God. Whereas someone who says, I got it all. I got it covered. Oh, you got it covered? God says, okay, you got it covered. You could take care of it. You don't need my help. And indeed, you're on your own. Chapter 48 begins and Jacob is ill and Joseph is given a message that your father is ill. So he takes his two sons, Menashe and Ephraim, with him to go to Jacob to get a blessing from him before he passes away. And Jacob invokes to Joseph the blessing that he received from God. God told him, I will make you numerous and fruitful. I will make you a congregation of nations. Rashi explains that what Joseph is being told here is that God promised that he's going to have more tribes descending from him. Even after Benjamin was born, there's going to be two more tribes. And therefore, before Jacob is about to pass away, he is going to nominate Ephraim and Manasseh to be two more tribes of the Jewish people. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before my coming to you in Egypt shall be mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be like Reuven and Shimon, like, like my two sons, Reuben and Shimon. Your two sons will be the same. They too will have that same stature as heads of tribes. But all your subsequent children that are born afterwards, after I arrived to the land of Egypt, they shall be part of either the tribe of Ephraim or the tribe of Menashe. And Jacob continues to talk about what happened to Rachel when Rachel died. Rachel died as they were about to enter the land of Canaan, and they were very close to the city of Hebron, to the burial spot of Abraham and Isaac, of the tomb of the patriarchs. But Jacob did not bury her there. Rather, he buried her on the road to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Jacob knows that Joseph is disappointed that he didn't bury his mother, Rachel, in the tomb of the patriarchs. But Jacob tells him, I want to let you know that I didn't do it because of my own decision. I did it because the Almighty instructed me to do it. 
Why? Because sometime in the future, when the Babylonians are sending the Jewish people in chains to Babylon after the destruction of the first temple, they're going to stop along this same road and they're going to pray by Rachel's tomb and Rachel in heaven is going to invoke mercy from God. And therefore, the Almighty told me, place Rachel over here because she is going to be of vital importance to her descendants many, many hundreds of years down the line. And therefore, Joseph, don't be upset that I didn't bury Rachel in that place where I asked you to bury me. I did it because of the instruction of God. The Ramban adds that Jacob did not personally want to bury his wife Rachel in that tomb because he was embarrassed to have married two sisters and therefore he only buried Leah. She was the first one that he married and that marriage did not encroach upon the prohibition against married two sisters. So he buried Leah there and not Rachel. And then Jacob turns his attention to the sons of Joseph. And then Israel saw Joseph's sons and he said, who are these? So if we read this simply, it seems like Jacob is getting old. He's maybe going a little senile and he doesn't recognize his grandchildren. Rashi says something fascinating. He sees the sons of Joseph and he wants to bless him and prophecy departs from him. Why? Because terrible sinners are going to descend from both Ephraim and Menashe. So there's a few takeaways from this. First of all, Jacob is such a a prophet that he's able to see in Ephraim and Menashe, he sees those two people, but he actually is able to filter through all their future descendants. The descendants of the future are already inherent in the forebearers centuries prior. He sees Ephraim and Menashe, and there's something within them already today that indicates that there's something problematic in the future. And therefore he asks, who are these people? These people are not worthy of receiving my blessing. Joseph convinces him, these are my sons who God has given to me. And Jacob says, okay, bring them to me and I will bless them. And this blessing is going to be quite dramatic. Jacob is old and he's going a little blind like his father Isaac before him. And Joseph brings the two children close to him. He kisses them, he hugs them. He's so excited that I I was hoping maybe to see you, and now I get to see not only you, I get to see your children as well. And then something very dramatic and unusual happens. Jacob is going to give a blessing to each one of these children, and he's going to place his right hand on the child deserving of the greater honor. Who is that? Well, Joseph thinks that it's Menashe, because Menashe is older. So therefore, Joseph takes Menashe to his left, which is Jacob's right, and Ephraim to his right, which is Jacob's left. And Jacob maneuvers his hands, he swaths them, he crosses them over and places his right hand on Ephraim and his left hand on Menashe. And the commentaries tell us something very interesting here. Jacob was old and was blind, and there were two children brought before him, and What he wanted to do was not the same as what the person who brought those two children wanted to do. Does that sound somewhat familiar? The Balaturim says, yes. When Isaac was old, when Isaac was blind, Jacob coordinated the switcheroo where he took the two sons, meaning him and his brother Esau, and he switched the two. And similarly, almost tit for tat, when Jacob is old and Jacob's blind, someone else is going to take two sons and swap them. Jacob begins his blessing by blessing Joseph, and he tells him, O God, before whom my forefathers Abram and Isaac walk from my inception until this day, may the angel who redeems me from all evil bless the lads, and may my name be declared upon them, and the names of my forefathers Abram and Isaac, and may they proliferate abundantly like fish within the land. So Jacob begins his blessing, and it's a blessing to Joseph that his children flourish, may they proliferate abundantly like the fish within the land. But meanwhile, Joseph is perturbed because he sees his father switching his hands and he tries to fix the problem. And Joseph says to his father, not so, father, for this is the firstborn. Place your right hand on his head. But his father refused, saying, I know, my son, I know. He too will become a people and he too will become great. Yet his younger brother shall become greater than he and his offspring's name will fill 
the nations. Continuing the theme that we've seen time and time again throughout Genesis, it's the younger brother who will triumph over the older brother. Ephraim is going to be greater than Menashe, and therefore it is worthy for him to receive the greater blessing. Why is Ephraim going to be greater than Menashe? Says Rashi, because Joshua, the disciple of Moses, is going to be a direct descendant of Ephraim. He is going to conquer the land of Israel for the Jewish people, teach them Torah, and therefore Ephraim and the whole tribe of Ephraim is greater than the tribe of Manasseh. He too, Manasseh, will have great descendants, but nothing that will equal to Joshua, and therefore Ephraim is worthy of the greater blessing. And then in verse 20, Jacob blesses Ephraim and Menashe themselves. And he says, By you shall Israel bless, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Menashe. Simcha like him to Ephraim and Menashe. And he, pl- and he placed Ephraim before Menashe. The blessing that Jacob gave to Ephraim and Menashe is that they will be the model. They will be the template through which all fathers, all parents bless their children. When, when we today, in 2018, 2019, we bless our children, we say, may God make you like Ephraim and Menashe. In fact, many families, our family, for example, we have a tradition to bless our children every Friday night. What blessing do we give to our boys? Yesimcha elokim to Ephraim and Menashe. May God make you like Ephraim and Menashe. Why are these two boys the model that we tell our children, we hope, we pray that our children will become? So the commentaries tell us that these two children really are two sons that survived and thrived in the exile. They were, there were, there were many existential threats facing these children. Ephraim and Manasseh, they grew up in Egypt, submerged in Egyptian culture, yet they maintained their convictions, their commitments to Torah, to its ideals. They were able to withstand the onslaught around them, and therefore we too hope that our children, even though they grow up in maybe a morally bankrupt society, they too can flourish. Ephraim and Manasseh, they were like Reuben and Shimon. They did not suffer the degradation of the generation that's typical. They were the only grandsons of Jacob that were equal to his sons. And that's something that we hope and yearn that our children will have. A, that they will flourish despite the threats around them. B, that they will not suffer the ill effects of the changeover in the generation. They will be able to maintain the stature of their parents. Chapter 48 ends with Jacob giving Joseph another gift and that is the city of Shechem. The city of the Shechem is a city that Jacob conquered with his own sword and bow. And therefore, that portion will be in the hands of Joseph, specifically because Joseph toiled in tending to ensure that Jacob has the burial spot that he wants in the land of Israel. Therefore, Jacob will give him an extra city to be a burial spot for him in the land of Israel. And indeed, until this day, we could go, even though it's somewhat of a dangerous neighborhood, we could go to the city of Shechem, the city of what's called today Nablus, and visit Kever Yosef, the burial spot of Joseph, Jacob gave it to him specifically because Joseph w- agreed to tend to Jacob's burial. And this city, Jacob tells him, he acquired with his sword and with his arrow. Says Rashi, what does it mean, his sword and his arrow? He chachmaso vitvilaso. It is his wisdom and it is his prayer. And here we're told that Torah, the wisdom, and prayer and tefillah, those are comparable to a sword and a bow. What's the difference between the two? A sword is used for close combat. You can't really use it if something is very far away. Whereas prayer is more like shooting to the distance. It's the arrow. It, a, will always hit a target. And B, it could effectuate down the line. Whereas Torah is almost like hand-to-hand combat. Interesting idea. Chapter 49 is one of the most iconic chapters in Genesis. Jacob is on his deathbed and he calls all his sons. He gathers them around and he's going to tell them what's going to happen to them in the end of days. And he gives them blessings, 
Some of them are maybe rebuke. In fact, we find out at the end of the Torah, Moses does the same on his deathbed. He too gives rebuke to the Jewish people. He doesn't do it earlier. He waits till the last of his days. And similarly here, Jacob only rebukes and or blesses his sons when he's about to die. And it's one of the most poetic and layered portions in the Torah. Each verse has multiple, often quite disparate meanings. There's very long commentaries in Rashi. And of course, we won't be able to go through everything, but we'll try to cover a lot. The first Rashi begins is that Jacob wants to tell them what's going to happen to them in the end of days. He was desirous to reveal the end, but the prophecy departed from him, and he started saying different things. That's what Rashi says. This is somewhat unusual. Jacob, it seems like from Rashi, was planning on giving an entirely different speech, but magically, he had a second speech chambered, ready to go, when his notes were taken away. It seems very, very strange. What does this mean that Jacob was planning to give one speech and he started saying something entirely different? And as we find out, it's a very poetic speech. He just had that planned and that wasn't part of his original speech. So the theory here is that even when Jacob was giving a rebuke, it really was a blessing. What he was revealing to his children, as we will go through one by one, he was revealing their root unchangeable character. What was the nature of each one of his sons? And this is quite valuable. It's a blessing. If someone knows their character, they know the tools and the drawbacks that they have, and they're able to navigate life more successfully. If you know what strengths you have and you know what weaknesses you have, you can set up yourself for success based upon that important information. And therefore, even the sons that he rebukes we find it as a great, it is a great blessing because he is giving them tremendous information that they could use towards directing their life in the right path. So maybe what actually Jacob wanted to do and what Jacob did, those two things are not so distant. He wanted to reveal the end. He wanted to reveal the destination. He wanted to re- reveal the destiny of each one of his children. And he wasn't able to do that. The prophecy departed from him. But instead, he revealed the tools that they're going to use to get there. Meaning that was all part of his speech. His speech was where you're going and how you're going to get there. And he wasn't allowed to say where you're going, but he still maintained the second half of his speech, the how you are going to get there, and he you're going to get there via the innate tools that you have. So he begins with Reuven. Reuben, Reuben, you are my son, my strength, and my initial vigor, foremost in rank and foremost in power. Reuben was the firstborn, and therefore he was rightfully supposed to be the firstborn. He was supposed to be the king. He was supposed to be the priest. He was supposed to have all the accolades, all the special titles that were supposed to be dispensed. However, Water-like impetuosity, you cannot be foremost because you mounted your father's bed and you desecrated him who ascends upon my couch. Because of your water-like impetuosity, because you make decisions rashly, maybe even emotionally, without properly evaluating the pros and the cons, therefore, you're going to lose those positions that you were destined to have. And of course, that sounds terrible. If you are Reuben, this doesn't sound like a blessing at all. Jacob reveals to him, you were supposed to be the king. You're supposed to be the priest. But you know what? You lost it because in the episode of Bilhah, after Rachel died, you dragged Jacob's bed. You got involved in Jacob's conjugal life. And that showed a certain impetuosity. That showed that you didn't actually think before you acted. And therefore, as a punishment, you are losing the kingdom, you are losing the priesthood. But if we understand this on a deeper level, we realize it's not a punishment at all. Jacob's revealing that Reuben has some innate character that is impetuosity. He acts before he thinks. You know what's the worst job for someone with that character? For someone like that to be a king. A king who wields tremendous power. If they use that power in this manner, and they use it without thinking, it could be detrimental to the country. 
And therefore, for someone like that, someone who's particularly ill-suited to be a teen, it's in fact a great blessing to know that they are ill-suited to be a teen and to be told you are not longer, you are no longer a good candidate for this role. In addition, the priest, the priest has to deal with very complex labyrinthine laws in the temple. And if you mess up the order or if you act in a improper way, it could be disastrous. And therefore, Jacob reveals to Reuben, you two are not suited for that job. It sounds like a curse, but really it is a blessing. And then he moves out to Shimon and Levi. Shimon and Levi are comrades. Their weaponry is stolen craft. And he is invoking what happened with the city of Shechem when they slaughtered an entire city. The craft that you used was stolen. You stole it from Asa, from Esau. It's not me acting. It is your uncle. You stole his method of behavior, that of total violence. In their conspiracy, may my soul not enter. With their congregation, do not join my honor. For in their rage, they murder people, and at their whim, they hamstrung an ox. In the future, there's going to be very upsetting incidents with the tribe of Shimon and the tribe of Levi. Levi is going to spawn Korah, who's going to mount a rebellion against Moses, The head of the tribe of Shimon is Zimri, who is going to very publicly act in a very immoral way. And when they're attributed, when their ancestry is attributed, it's going to go up to, but not including, Jacob. He's going to say, in their congregation, in their conspiracy, I don't want a part of. They're not acting like me, like my children. They're acting like Esau, and therefore it does not associate back to me. Accursed is their rage, for it is intense, and their wrath, for it is harsh. Jacob is cursing not them, only their anger. I will separate them from within Jacob, and I will disperse them in Israel. And this too can be construed as a blessing. Shimon and Levi, their comrades. A few weeks ago, we had Joseph separating Shimon from Levi, because they're a very dangerous duo. These people, they are inspired by brotherhood maybe even by nationalism. When they're together, they get riled up and they could turn into a mob and a very dangerous and violent mob. And that is a character that they have built in. It's it's natural. And therefore, Jacob is telling them that they're acting improperly and he's highlighting their characteristic that is flawed. And he's also telling them the solution. I will separate them within Jacob and I will disperse them within Israel. The tribe of Shimon, they're going to be traveling peddlers, they're going to be scribes, they're going to be teachers of school children, but they're going to be scattered throughout the land. And because they're scattered throughout the land, they're not going to be able to bond together to have this toxic mix and to explode in anger. Similarly, the tribe of Levi, they're going to be the priests and they're going to be scattered, dispersed throughout the land. They're not going to have one tribal ancestral homeland. They're going to be everywhere and therefore they won't have this unity that could lead to a tinderbox of violence. And now Judah, the fourth brother, he hears this rebuke that's being dispensed to Reuben, Shimon, and Levi, and he starts to recoil. He says, well, what's going to be? Is now Jacob going to rebuke me for what happened with me and Tamar? And Jacob tells him, no, Judah, you, your brother shall acknowledge your hand, will be at your enemy's nape. Your father's sons will prostrate themselves before you. You displayed the characteristics of leadership of kingdom by saving your brother. Joseph, you were the one to say we shouldn't kill him. You admitted that you were wrong in the episode of Tamar, and therefore you were going to be the king. You displayed gallantry, and therefore you will merit David and Solomon, the lions of Israel, will be your descendants. A lion cub is Judah. From the prey, my son, you elevated yourself. He crouched, lies down like a lion, and like an awesome lion, who dares rouse him? All kings of Israel, all exile arcs of Babylon, from David's time onward, are going to be from Judah until the arrival of Messiah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the scholar from among his descendants, until Shiloh's arrival. Shiloh's reference to Messiah, and his will be an assemblage of nation. His land will be drenched in wine. There will be plentiful pastures for animals, producing lots of milk, red-eyed from wine, and white-toothed from 
milk, says the Talmud in the book of Ksubas, page 111a. Rabbi Yochanan says, it is better to whiten your teeth to your fellow, to smile at your fellow, than to give him milk to drink. Even though when you give something tangible like milk, it's it's very appreciated, but when you show them the white of your teeth, it is even more appreciated. And it derives it from this verse that the whiteness of teeth is better than milk. The next two sons of Jacob are Zebulon and Yisachar, Zebulon and Issachar. These are going to be a tag team. They're going to have an agreement. Zebulon shall settle by the seashore. He's going to be a businessman. He's going to live at the seashore in the marketplace. He shall be at the ship's harbor and his last border will reach Zidon. He's going to be the businessman who's going to make a lot of money. And he's going to have a partnership with Yisachar, who's going to be the strong-boned donkey. He rests between the boundaries. What does that mean? It means that that Yisachar is going to be like a donkey that bears a very heavy load. The load of all of Torah is going to be on the tribe of Yisachar. They're going to be a tribe of scholars, and they're going to have a partnership with Zavulon. Zavulon is going to provide the finances. Yisachar is going to provide the Torah, and they'll split both pots equally. Half of Zavulon's money goes to Yisachar, and half of Yisachar's Torah goes to Zavulon. And indeed, Zavulon is going to merit to have half the Torah. And in fact, even though he is younger than Yisachar, he's mentioned first both here and when most when Moses blesses the tribes in the end of the Torah, because his role is going to make it feasible for Yisachar to study Torah. Like the Mishnah tells us, if there is no flower, there is no Torah. Without Zavulon, Yisachar cannot flourish. Yisachar is compared to a donkey. A donkey, it's different than a horse. When a horse rests, you take off the load, whereas the donkey's load is never removed. The load of Torah is upon him at all times. And he's going to shoulder the burden of the Jewish people, become an indentured laborer for the Jewish nation. He's going to do all the hard work necessary to facilitate the very complicated Torah matters. For example, figuring out the calendar, that is a burden that he is going to bear to benefit the Jewish people. Dan will avenge his people. The next tribe is the tribe of Dan, and this is a reference to Shimshon, to Samson, the judge. He will avenge the Jewish people. The tribe of Israel will be united behind him. He's compared to a serpent, to a viper. He is going to bite the horse's heel and the rider falls back. That's a reference to the famous episode of Samson where he topples a building, not by destroying the building itself, but by destroying its foundations. God is going to be a regiment that will retreat on its heels. That's a reference to uh, the tribe of God. They're going to actually live on the east bank of the Jordan River. They're going to live in the lands conquered by Moses. However, they will join their Jewish brethren. They will cross over the Jordan, cross over and engage in the war of conquest of the west bank of the Jordan with Joshua. Even though they're going to live on the east bank and they'll conquer the land with legions, but none of them will perish in the war. They will all retrace their steps and return to the east bank. From Asher, his bread will have richness and he will provide kingly delicacies. This is a reference to the land of Asher. It's going to be rich in oil. Rashi tells us this is the oil of olives, olive oil. You know, Houston, where I live, is an oil town, and someone showed me that they have a whole prospectus to invest in oil drilling in the the territory of Asher because of all the references to oil, both here and the book of Deuteronomy. When there's a blessing to the tribe of Asher, it's referencing oil. Maybe there's actually lots of oil there. Naphtali is compared to a swift deer. What this means, Rashi gives us three different interpretations. One of them is that when Jacob's body was brought to the land of Israel, to the cave of the Machpelah, to the tomb of the patriarchs, Esau was there not letting them bury them. And he says, well, it's my slot. He says, no, you sold it to, to Jacob. Well, where's the documentation? Well, they left it in Egypt. So Naphtali, who was very swift, he ran back or he, uh, he hurried back to go get the documentation.
And finally, we get to Joseph. Joseph, a charming son, a charming son to the eye. Each of the daughters climbed heights to gaze. When Joseph was nominated as king of Egypt, all the girls of Egypt climbed on top of the walls to get a glimpse of him to be able to see him in his beauty. He's also a charming son to the eye. So Rashi gives us a whole bunch of interpretation of what that means. But it tells us, for, for example, one of them is that when Jacob and his family was about to, were about to meet Esau, the mothers preceded their children, with one exception. When Rachel was going to meet Esau, Joseph went in front of her, made himself big, and tried to block Esau from looking at his mother. And he said, and his rationale was that this wicked one, he should not place his eyes upon my mother. And that is part of the blessing here to Joseph that Jacob is highlighting that you made yourself big upon the eye of Esau and therefore you merited greatness. Alternatively, Joseph is on top of the eye, meaning that in his descendants, the evil eye will have no effect. He will be immune from the Ainra, from the evil eye. They embittered him and became antagonists. The arrow-tongued men hated him. J- Jacob is invoked in the fact that Joseph did not have a very easy life, but his bow was firmly in place and his arms were gilded from the hands of the mighty power of Jacob. From there, he shepherded the stone of Israel. What does this mean? Various interpretations in Rashi. Either it's a reference to him receiving kingdom from God and becoming the rock of Israel, or it's a reference to him overcoming the seductions of Potiphar's wife, of his master's wife, via conjuring the image of his father in the window. Jacob increases the blessings given to Joseph. The blessings of your father surpass the blessings of my parents to the endless bounds of the world's hills. Let all the blessings that I had be upon Joseph's head and he and upon the head of the exile from his brothers. And finally, there is the last tribe, the last son of Jacob is Benjamin. Benjamin is compared to a predatory wolf. This is one of the many times that the children of Jacob are compared to animals. In the morning, he will devour prey and the evening, he will distribute spoils. The morning That is a reference to the beginning of the nation's zenith. The first king of Israel is Saul, who descends from the tribe of Benjamin, and he will conquer booty. And in the waning hours of our peak in the evening, Mordechai and Esther, in the Purim story, they too are from the tribe of Benjamin, and they will distribute and divide the spoils. And thus concludes the blessings that Jacob gave to his Children, all these are the tribes of Israel, 12, and this is what their father spoke to them, and he blessed them, and he blessed each according to his appropriate blessing. Rashi tells us that he actually included them all in one collective blessing, and even the each individual blessing that he gave to each individual son, he also spread that out to the rest of his sons. Right before Jacob passes away, he once again reiterates his command to all of his children to be buried in the land of Israel, in the field of Ephron the Chittite, in that cave of Machpelah, where Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, and Leah are buried. Jacob finished instructing his children. He drew his feet onto his bed. He expired and was gathered to his people. Rashi quotes the Talmud that Jacob, in fact, didn't die. What that means is that he didn't suffer the same effects of death. It was a seamless transition from life to death. His soul and his body were separated the same way someone takes off a pair of pants. Chapter 50 is the final chapter in the book of Genesis. Jacob has passed away. Jacob is embalmed for 40 days. He is mourned for 70 days. All of Egypt mourns him. Like we said, he's a great hero. And now it's time to transport him back to the land of Israel to bury him as Joseph had promised. So Joseph goes to Pharaoh and says to Pharaoh, my father made me swear, telling him, saying, behold, I'm going to die. Bury me in my grave, which I've hewn for myself, land of Canaan. There you are to bury me. Now I will go up, if you please, and bury my father, and then I will return. 
So Pharaoh responds, go up and bury your father as he made you swear. Says Rashi, what he's telling him is that I, the only reason why I'm letting you bury him in the land of Israel is because he made you swear. But if he did not make you swear, then I would not allow you to do it. And what was Pharaoh's calculus? Why did Pharaoh allow Joseph to bury his father in the land of Israel because he made him swear? Why does that matter? Rashi tells us that there was another agreement that Joseph had had with Pharaoh. In in the land of Egypt, in order for someone to be Pharaoh, they have to know all the languages. And when Joseph met Pharaoh and they started investigating which languages does Joseph know, which languages does Pharaoh know, it turns out that Joseph spoke Hebrew, but Pharaoh did not. And therefore, by Egyptian law, Pharaoh was disqualified from being Pharaoh. But Joseph said, you know what, don't worry about it. I won't reveal it. No one will know. This will be our little secret. And in fact, Joseph swore to that effect. He swore that he's not going to reveal the secret. And therefore, Rashi tells us that the reason why Pharaoh allowed Joseph to bury Jacob in the land of Israel because of an oath was because he was worried that if he forces him to transgress on that oath that Joseph gave to Jacob, maybe he will come to transgress the oath that he gave to Pharaoh. And this does not necessarily mean that this will be immediate, that immediately after Joseph is forced to transgress one oath, he'll right away go announce to the tabloids that Pharaoh doesn't speak Hebrew. No, the meaning is that Joseph was someone who was a man of truth, and therefore he was not accustomed to lying. He was he would always say what what's true, and he would keep his word. But Pharaoh recognized that if you forced him to transgress one oath, that could lead to a slippery slope. He'll become calloused and desensitized to oaths, and therefore there may come a time in the future where Joseph will reveal the secret, transgress the second oath, that will only happen because he was already customized to transgressing oaths. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all of Pharaoh's servants. There's a very lengthy description of Jacob's funeral procession. All of Jacob's servants, the elders of his household, all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all of Joseph's household, his brothers and his father's household, everyone, only the young children and the flocks and the cattle did they leave in Goshen. And they traveled with chariots and with horsemen. The camp was very large. They arrived in Gorna Atad. There was a very long and great eulogy. There were seven days of mourning. Everyone was mourning. The Talmud says that all the kings of the land of Canaan paid tribute to Jacob. They put their crown on top of his beer. And his sons did for him exactly as he instructed. His sons carried him to the land of Canaan and they buried him in the cave of Machpelah. Rashi tells us that this was his sons, not including Joseph. Joseph was a king, not including Levi, because Levi is in the future going to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And not including grandchildren, because the grandchildren were born from uh, Canaanite women and therefore Jacob did not want them holding his beer. The Talmud tells us that when they arrived in the cave by Machpelah, Esau was there. Like we said earlier, he he demanded evidence that this indeed belonged to Jacob. And and Naphtali ran down to Egypt to try to retrieve the evidence. But Chushim, Chushim was the only son of of Dan, and he was deaf. And he wasn't figuring, he wasn't following exactly what was happening, but he realized that something odd was happening. They weren't burying Jacob right away. So he asked someone, what's going on? They said, they pointed, see that man, that man stopping Jacob from being buried. And he got enraged. He says, this person is going to stop Jacob from being buried. He grabbed a stick. He hit him really hard in his head. He decapitated Esau. Esau's head rolled into the cave and they buried Jacob. It's been pointed out, and we've mentioned this in the past, that Esau, in his head, he was like the rest of the forefathers. Intellectually, he was equal to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The problem was that it didn't filter down to his body, and therefore it's poetic justice that his head and his head alone is buried in the tomb of the patriarchs. His body is buried elsewhere. So everyone heads back to Egypt, and Joseph's brothers realize that they may have a problem. 
maybe now Joseph will actually unleash his revenge against them now that Jacob has deceased. So they make up a story and they tell Joseph, your father gave orders before his death saying, thus shall you say to Joseph, please kindly forgive the spiteful deed of your brothers and the sin that they have done for you. And they say, listen, forgive us what we've done. We'll be your slaves. But Joseph said to them, fear not, for am I instead of God? Although you intended me harm, God intended it for good. In order to accomplish, it is as clear as this day that the vast people be kept alive. Joseph tells him, am I instead of God? If I wanted to harm you, could I even do it? After all, there was 10 of you. All 10 of you tried to harm me, but because God had different plans, I wasn't harmed. And in fact, it ended up very well. If I am only one person, I want to harm you and God doesn't want to harm you, I can't possibly do it. And Joseph continues to comfort them, to speak to their hearts, to provide them reassurance. So now fear not, I will sustain you and your young ones. Thus he comforted them and he spoke to their heart. And the Parsha and the book ends, Joseph dwells in the land of Egypt, him and his father's household. He lived to 110 years old. He was able to see his great-grandchildren flourish. And Joseph, in the third to last verse of the book, tells his brothers, I'm about to die and God will surely remember you and bring you out, up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. And just like I took Jacob out of here, remember and take my bones out of there, Joseph died at the age of 110. They embalmed him and he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Joseph tells his brothers and tells the Jewish people a secret code, God will remember you. These words are a secret code that's going to be uttered by Moses when he's going to lead the Jews out of the land of, of Egypt. He's going to say these magic words, Pakod Yifko, God will remember us. Chazak, chazak, venis chazek. We have concluded the book of Genesis. It began with Adam. It ends with the death of Jacob's children. The Jewish people are now a veritable nation. And in the very first chapter of the book of Exodus, as we will read next week, Things are going to head south very precipitously in the land of Egypt.